Welcome back. The technical glitch we had with the first guest can, could not be resolved. Now we move into our second segment. November 2nd is a day recognized as the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. The resolution was made by the United Nations General Assembly at its 60, 68th session in 2013, urging member states to implement definite measures countering the present culture of impunity. Governments, civil society, the media, and everyone concerned to uphold the rule of law have been asked to join in global efforts to end impunity for crimes against journalists. This year, the main commemoration of this significant day is scheduled to take place today and tomorrow, the 2nd and the 3rd of November, with the event aimed at strengthening ties between organizations and actors involved in the promotion of freedom of expression and enforce a coordinated response to the threats faced by journalists. The date was chosen in commemoration of the assassination of two French journalists in Mali on November 2nd, 2013. Joining me to discuss this is Jalingo Agba, journalist. Agba Jalingo. Welcome so, to uh, Plus Politics. Thank you so much, uh, Mona. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rushing to go from there. Yeah, you know, while I was talking, I'm sorry about that. Then, by the way, I'm talking about the board of the I hope you can hear me well enough. You seem to be breaking. I can, I can hear you. Okay, for, okay because for a while, uh, you were not too audible to me. Uh, uh, Abba, you. You are live. You you lived through some experience not too long ago. You want to, uh, you want to basically intimate our public. <laughs> well, I I think that all the history and the stories that were made from my recent uh, ordeal with uh, sports teams was actually written by the public. The public that wrote the story. I. Wasn't available to write public algebra. Uh, it's public knowledge. I had a very young man in the past. All these experiences were actually chronicled by uh, journalists all over the country. I I had to, twice in the past uh, four years, or five approximately, I had to go in into jail twice for attempting to do my work. I first, uh, even the first and the second were all with the uh, immediate family of the immediate past governor of Prosper State, Governor Ben Ayadi. Even though the charges that were profiled against me in 2019 when I was arrested, uh, the court case said it was uh, Federal Republic of Nigeria versus Agua Jalingu. But of course, it was known to everybody that followed the issues that it was the immediate past governor of my state that was behind uh, all of my ordeal. And uh, even the subsequent matter, is still uh, placed on the same doorstep. The, the thing is that, um, the summary is that I tried to do my work uh, in cross over state as a journalist, calling government to account. And that has come with a lot of consequences. It has cost me, um, in the first instance, it cost me 179 days of incarceration at the African prison. And of course, at the anti cultism unit in, in cross over state, that's about six months. And uh, a trial that lasted for three years before I was discharged and acquitted. Then the second round started where I was kept at the Avatio police station in Abuja and, of course, uh, kept at the Kujay prison for an additional nine days. I've been charged to court, and by next week again, I will still be in court on Wednesday next week to answer to the criminal charges that were prepared against. So it's a, it's a long story. It's out there for the public, uh, but, I, but I think basically that's the summary of what has happened in the past uh, five years. Twice. Uh, in prison and uh, a couple of other times at the police station for trying to do my work. And it's uh, the ordeal of so many journalists up to this time, even after 25 years of democracy. So uh, the initial time, were you, were you feed or what became of the case? Just wanting to uh, make sure that we have a chronological logic to, to the two incidents. Well, 
Yeah, just is uh, each of you could discharge and acquitted the matter after three years of trial. The state was able to call any witness against me, and I was diligently attending my court sessions. The matter went through, but from Justice Amoveda to Justice uh, Shoibu to Justice uh, Ijoma, uh, who eventually said that uh, if after three years the, the state cannot call a witness against me, then it meant that he didn't have any case against me. So the matter was discharged and acquitted. The second one is a matter of defamation. That's what they said. And it's the police that also filed a charge against me. And uh, that matter is still ongoing. Uh, two witnesses have been called. And uh, on Wednesday, the trial will continue at the Federal High Court in Abuja. So that's what we are looking up to. But for the first one, I was discharged and acquitted because I was charged for four counts, charged for terrorism, treasonable felony, cultism, and attempt to overthrow the president of the former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Buhari. But the state was able to call any witness against me for three years, and I was the matter was thrown out of. But this one is still ongoing, so. I wouldn't want to talk about the things the matter is too so. But you, you, you still have to be traveling between Calabar and uh, and Abuja on days uh, that the case is listed for hearing. Uh, is that is that so? Yeah, for three years I kept going from Lagos to. Yeah, from for three years I kept going from Lagos to Calabar every court date, and right now. I still have to travel from uh, Lagos to Abuja to, to stand trial because on both occasions the police came to actually kidnap me from my residence, <laughs> from the hands of my wife and my family. They actually visited me in my house to come grab me away from here. So on both occasions I have to travel either from Lagos to Calabar or from Calabar to Abuja. And uh, I should also say that uh, in almost all of these uh, incidences, they have filed um, both criminal and civil charges against me. So we, the court dates, I'm, I'm just talking about the criminal matters now that I'm talking, but there are other civil cases amounting to close to 10 billion naira standing in court against me for uh, alleged um, claims of uh, defamation and all of that. But uh, they haven't been able to secure any conviction and some of the matters have been thrown away and some are still ongoing. I think. But in the first case, when you were acquitted, uh, the court did not award you any recompense for for the rigmarole and the and the denial of liberty that you suffered before the judge got so exasperated and and let you off. It wasn't one of the demands of my lawyers before the court. I think what happened. To that regard was that um, Sarah uh, went to the ECOWAS court to file matters for the enforcement of my fundamental human rights, and the ECOWAS court awarded 30 million naira damages to me, which have not been paid till today, because the federal government is reluctant to uh, implementing decisions of the ECOWAS court. But, however, as it stands today, the federal government is owing me 30 million naira for violating my fundamental human rights, according to the judgment of the ECOWAS court. Uh, I came, when, uh, when I came out of prison, I testified in that court uh, via Zoom, and uh, the court gave a judgment and said that the government should pay me 30 million naira for violating my right. It was the court court that said that, but uh, an indigenous court here back home has not been able to give that judgment because it wasn't part of, of our demands before the court. If I need to, I'm the one that can now go to court and demand for such damages, uh, having been discharged and acquitted by the court. But I, I didn't see that as a priority for myself. What could have instructed all this um, seemingly sadistic experiences? What, what, you don't, you are not the only journalist in Nigeria. What, why would they be lasering on you? You have any idea? Well, Christopher State is a very, very conservative state. Uh, that wasn't used to the kind of journalism that I do. You see, what even somebody like Rufa Hussein in Arise TV is going through today, uh, the, the kind of journalism we do in this country is not the kind of journalism that rattles anybody. People are content with just going to ask questions and coming to say what Mr. A said. People are not used to being pushed to a box to answer questions on behalf of the public. And the moment you ask those questions, 
they come after you. I don't think it was any specific case. Before then, we and Rona, they were very close friends. And uh, it just got to a point where they felt that I was asking too many questions and they needed to try to shut me up. That was what happened, actually. I don't think it was, there was anything special about uh, what happened. Uh, somebody just felt that you are not supposed to be asking me these questions. You are my brother, you are my friend, you are not supposed to. And I said, no, we are not doing a family meeting here. I'm going to ask the questions that I'm supposed to ask as a coach. Who said, and, uh, who said you, you shouldn't have been asking the kind of questions you were asking? Of course, the former governor, he wasn't, he wasn't happy that I was asking. No, nobody in public office will appreciate you when you are asking the kind of tough questions I was asking. And uh, they miscalculated, they thought that... Um, Coming at me in that manner was going to stop me from doing that, but it was actually a miscalculation, and I think that um, that point is clear to everybody by right now. But uh, you say there are also civil cases filed against you. Uh, are you per chance also? Yes, they are. Are you per chance also thinking of counter filing cases for the? Uh, for the sufferings and bad experiences that you've had to to suffer? Well, I don't know if we will get to that point, but for now, I, it, it's some part of my my regular routine to dream of dragging people to court. I just want to do my job uh, as a journalist do the best I can do. I see journalism as a tool to change society, and I'm very interested in waking up every morning and spending all my time to see how I can ask the hard questions, dog after the heels of those who are in power and ask them those questions that they don't want anybody to ask. Going to court will only distract my attention. It's not part of what I'm what's the, what's the final, mm -hmm. What's the final words to fellow journalists who may and not have experienced something like this, but we may need to be psychologically prepared for the day it may, it may come. The truth is that Nigeria today, the enemy of the fortright journalists is uh, fellow colleagues. Uh, suddenly, people will come out and call you names and tell you you are not a journalist, like they are telling you what you're saying now. Call your kinds of names, demonize you, to make sure they weaken your resolve. If you want to do journalism in Nigeria, I've seen people, I tell my colleagues that I am particularly not concerned about the certificate you are carrying. I'm more particularly concerned about the impact of the reports and the stories that you are doing. What is it you are unveiling and how much change is it bringing to the society? It is on that basis that you earn my respect. Uh, people must learn to ask questions. If you're a young journalist and you aspire to do journalism and you want to ask questions, you must know that the first people that will come after you will not be even the states that you are criticizing. It's actually going to be your colleagues from the fourth state who will demonize you for reasons usually best known to them. Some of them is just simply because it's bringing you popularity, like, like it's bringing uh, Rufa Hussein and the rest of them. They will get angry with you. But if you want to ask these questions, you just have to be strong, be tough, and be ready to go through the, the crucible. That's the only thing that can distinguish really, you from the past. I really have to thank If you want to make stories that will bring a difference, you must be ready to go through some pain. Really uh, eventually, nothing is going to happen to you. You're just going to suffer some inconvenience. And at the end of the day, you are going to be fine. And then you will be distinguished. Thank you, Abajalingo. We really have to go now. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you. We wish you all the best in all these uh, encounters. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. God bless Nigeria. God bless journalism. Amen. Amen. Today's throwback. Remembering Delegiwa and other slain and abused journalists today. International Day to End Impunity Against Journalists. Delegiwa's gruesome murder remains a troubling chapter in Nigeria's history and a stark reminder of the pervasive culture of impunity surrounding security officers. Delegiwa, a renowned journalist and founding editor of now defunct Newswatch News magazine, was sadistically killed by a letter bomb while having breakfast with a colleague, Kyle De Shoyinka, on October 19, 1986. The Sunday morning incident sent shockwaves throughout the nation and the world. 
as it was a brazen attack on press freedom and a blatant act of violence against a journalist known for his stylistic and fearless reporting. Delegiwa's murder raised serious questions about the safety of journalists who dared to uncover truths and challenge the status quo. What makes this case particularly upsetting is the lack of accountability and justice that followed. Despite widespread speculation and demands for answers, the investigation into Delegiwa's murder seemed to have stalled eventually leading to a culture of impunity for those responsible. This incident served as a grim reminder of how security officers and powerful individuals could evade the precautions of their actions. The tragic event not only silenced a prominent voice in Nigerian journalism, but also highlighted the dangers faced by journalists whose works exposed corruption and challenged the establishment. It casts a shadow on the freedom of the press and the fundamental right of citizens to freely access unbiased information. Delegiwa's murder serves as a somber reminder of the need for a robust and independent justice system capable of holding those in power accountable for their actions. It also underscores the importance of fostering a culture that values and protects press freedom, ensuring the safety of journalists as they carry out their vital role in society. In conclusion, although the impunity surrounding the Legiwa's murder may have persisted for nearly three decades, it is crucial that we continue to demand justice and honor his memory by advocating for a society where no one is above the law, regardless of their position in and out of power. And that's it on the show tonight. I am Bola Hoba. Have a good night.